We're doing, we're, we're trucking along in, uh, in our study of covenant theology. Uh, we're looking today at the Davidic covenant, the Davidic covenant. And so we'll do a little bit of recap, but not much, and kind of move along into what is actually spoken of in the Davidic covenant. So we know that the, we're, we're kind of have placed all these covenants under their various headings and their what kingdom they relate to. In the kingdom of creation, the covenant of works, the one in the garden made with Adam, the Noahic covenant. Uh, in the kingdom of Israel, you have the old covenant, which is made up of the Abrahamic covenant, the Mosaic covenant, the Davidic covenant. That's where we're at today. And then you have in the kingdom of Christ, the covenant of redemption that oversees this entire thing, which we're going to see in a couple of weeks, how um, it kind of weaves its way through all these things and, and kind of arches over all things. And the new covenant, covenant of grace, that's made with Christ. Um, that is what all these things, what all these things point to, and what this is um, finished by. And so, that's kind of our structure. The Mosaic Covenant, uh, in or in the Abrahamic Covenant, God made certain promises to Abraham. He made promise for a people, for land, and for them to be a blessing to the nations. That's Genesis twelve, fifteen, and seventeen. In there, there's this covenant sign, this call to holiness and circumcision. So. The covenant of Abraham had a, a, an aspect of works that had to be done. Do this and live. Kind of the, the, the axiom of uh, a covenant that is works-based, similar to this. And so Abrahamic, Mosaic, and David, Davidic covenants have those aspects. And so the call to holiness was there and that if you had to be circumcised. If the males were not circumcised, then the covenant you were kicked out of the covenant of Abraham. And so how that whole thing works. So the land was promised to Abraham's people in the Abrahamic covenant. The Mosaic covenant kind of instituted the, full, the fullness of these laws of, that God used to rule the people in the land. So the people in the land is the, is, the nature, thank you, is the nature of the Abrahamic covenant. The people in the land, right? People, land. That's the nature of this. The Mosaic covenant is how to govern the people in the land, right? And the Davidic covenant is what uh, the, is where the kingdom of this kingdom of Israel really reaches its consummation, um, and so uh, then the promises here in Genesis 17, uh, God promised Abraham and Sarah that kings would come from them. So part of the the, the promise here was for people in Genesis 12, but in Genesis 17, it's even highlighted even more that it's not just people in general, but also kings that would come from the line. So promises narrowed down. Um, who does the promise get narrowed down to as we go through Genesis? All right, so promises made to Abraham, people, kings. It starts to narrow through the rest of Genesis. Who does it narrow down to? No, that's, well, that's later. That's the right Sunday school answer, but that's not. What? Okay, well, I mean, we see it, we see it kind of narrow down from um, Abraham to Isaac and Jacob then who? Judah. Judah. Right? Remember the promises made that Judah, the scepter will not depart from your hand. That's an interesting thing to say when there's not even a king yet. Not Jesus, Judah. <laughs> <laughs> he is the lion of Judah. Well, yeah, of course. And that's the, be- that's the beauty of this is that, it, and we're actually going to see this next week. Um, the, the, fu- the, the fulfillment of all the promises that are going to funnel themselves to Judah. We, we see them consummated in Christ, ultimately. So that's what I said. You're, yeah. Yeah. You just jumped a step. That's, a, that's it. Yeah. And so, um, yeah, so the covenant that establishes the kingship in Israel is the, is the promise, is the fulfillment of God's promise to Abraham right here. And so uh, th- there's a reason why we want to do this this way and why I keep coming back to this is these are not, th- th- though these are separate covenants, they're part of this larger old covenant structure that are dealing with one people in one place, with one giant promise. And the, the promises are made here, but they work themselves out through these covenants. Um, so, and so uh, the, the promise for kings isn't really realized until you have this covenant made with David. So part of the way we think through things is when you read through the old, say, oh, the old covenant, some people go, oh, the Mosaic covenant. No, it's the entirety of this, the fullness of these things, the Abrahamic, Mosaic, um, and Davidic covenants. Also, again, why I keep saying, I think this is helpful for us to realize that the covenant with Abraham, the Abrahamic covenant, is not, therefore, then the covenant of grace. 
it points forward to it, typologically, no doubt. It points forward to it. And, and aspects of it are, are in, in Christ. The same, just in different administrations. It's, a diff, it's different covenants. Which is why, again, the promise made for the new covenant is, I will make a covenant with you that is not like the covenants I made with your fathers. It's a different covenant. And so you read Jeremiah 31 and Ezekiel 36 and 37, and I think it helps highlight what the new covenant promises are about. Now, the Mosaic covenant governed everything, right? God told the Israelites when they entered the land they could have a king over themselves, um, one of their own. Entering and selling the land, though, wasn't a quick process, right? It, it, took, it took time. Um, Joshua and Caleb... And with the blessing and power of God, Israel enters Canaan. It obtains its inheritance. So the promises made back here in a land that was going to be theirs. Basically breaking all up into different, into different segments, portions to give to different peoples, the different tribes. Uh, the descendants of Abraham could settle in land. It's their land. Uh, and uh, God kept really, the fullness of the land that God promised was given to them to be enjoyed. The book of Joshua, I think in general, describes the fulfillment of God's promises to Abraham. You now have a people in the land. Joshua, kind of the fulfillment of the promises to Abraham. Now, is the book of Joshua primarily positive or negative? <laughs> Yes. That's like every, every book, right? Well, generally, Joshua's positive, right? Uh, things are good, generally speaking. Uh, there are times that Israel is disobedient and, and gets defeated. Um, but the problems that arise within the land really show up in the book of Judges, right? And that's where we see it all kind of fall apart. So let me read for you Judges chapter 2, verse 10. If you're keeping notes, these are passages you want to go back to. And you turn to Judges chapter 2. I think most of our look, uh, the passages we're going to look at today, we're going to go left to right. And so hopefully that will be helpful for you as you're finding this. Judges chapter 2, verse 10. And all that generation also were gathered to their fathers. And there arose another generation after them who did not know the Lord or the work he had done for Israel. And the people of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord and served the Baals. Let's go down to verse 20. So the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel. And he said, because this people have transgressed my covenant that I commanded their fathers and have not obeyed my voice, I will no longer drive out before them any of the nations that Joshua left when he died. Uh, someone asked me, uh, Ashley, asked me last week, oh, do you have a, is there a reason we're looking at Judges? Um, not, not so much that it ties with, uh, with what we're preaching through in Matthew, but more that it ties in with kind of what we're looking at in here. Right, so the book, the the sermon last week ties in, and, and this is what I've been thinking through. So when we said to take a week away, it was a natural process to go to what we've been looking at here. Um, what we saw last week in the the with Samson is kind of lifted up as the model for what the judges were, right? The, all the judges had problems. There's some that are better than others. I mean, Samson's not even the best. I don't think Samson's the best judge, but I do think he's the the, the perfect example of what the judges were generally, right? There's a lot of positive and a lot of negative. But in the end, God used that to point to a need for something greater and better. Um, here we are in the book of Judges, and uh, the people have transgressed the covenant. Moses has gone through, communicated the reality of God's promises and threats to that generation that went into Canaan, right? They saw the death of their parents in the wilderness, and that generation goes into the promised land and they obey God and they wipe out the enemies. They chose life in obedience rather than disobedience and death in the wilderness. But the next generation after that grew up in the land and didn't understand what it took to get there. And that generation that grew up in the land was idolatrous. And so really the key for understanding the context of the Davidic covenant is that God punished Israel for transgressing the covenant. They disobeyed the law of Moses, uh, the, the Mosaic Covenant, therefore they couldn't enjoy the blessings of the Abrahamic Covenant. And that's the part of the, the, where we see these things aren't disconnected, they're tied together. Because they broke this, they couldn't enjoy this. Right? 
it's not just the blessings of the Mosaic covenant. The Mosaic covenant, the blessings tied with obedience here is the, bless, is the promises that are made here. So when they broke this, what is it that they're covering? The people or the land? Well, those are the promises of the Abrahamic covenant, right? So the disobedience in these following covenants is all about maintaining the blessings, receiving the blessings that God has promised in the Abrahamic covenant. That's why these things are all tied together. They're one tight little ball of promises. And so the rest of the book of Judges is this pattern, right? A tribe's disobedient. God permits a foreign enemy to come in and wipe them out. God raises up a deliverer. Or the, the, people, the people cry out for God for a deliverer. God raises up a deliverer. The tribe is restored. And it's just that cycle over and over and over again, right? Disobedience, cry out for a re, or disobedience, foreign oppressor, cry out for deliverance. God gives a, a judge as a deliverer. And then dis, that judge dies, disobedience. Just that cycle over and over and over again. And so Genesis, Judges 2 lays that cycle out, and then the rest of the book of Judges shows you through all the Judges what it looks like for that. Um, the very last verse of, the, uh, of ju- the book of Judges leaves you with kind of the, the message, the kind of the depressing message. So I think Joshua is generally positive. Judges is generally depressing. You leave, Genesis, you leave Judges 21, verse 25, with this statement. In those days, there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. And so the people are left longing for and looking for what was really the answer to their, question, their problem was a king. Now, the judges were just kind of mini kings. They're, 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 they're doing activity um, that a king would do. Now, king has more responsibilities, but the judge's responsibilities would be taken on by a king. And that's the, pro- the context of the promise of the Davidic covenant. Israel enters the land prom- as promised to Abraham, but they disobeyed the law delivered to Moses. And as a result, they're afflicted, they're oppressed. There's no king in Israel. There's no obedience in Israel. The law is neglected. The people suffer. And what Israel needed was for someone to come in and keep the law of Moses for the nation, bringing b- blessing and deliverance to all the children of Abraham. That's what they need. Now, they need that. I don't, think it's, we, I don't think we could skip over historically. What is it that they wanted, though? So they get to that point. We have this statement at the end of Judges that there's no king in Israel. What is it that Israel wants? They want a king like everybody else. Not a king that God has promised. Not the king that's, that's foretold in, these, in the covenant promises. They want a king just like everybody else. So, turn to 1 Samuel, chapter 8. The people of Israel are being threatened by the Ammonites. They want a king to fight for them, and they ask Samuel to appoint one. But Samuel, does Samuel want to do that or no? No. Why does Samuel relent and give them and appoint them a king? Because God told him to. Isn't that interesting? It basically is, is God is saying, um, let's give them what they're asking for so they can see that what they're asking for is not what they really need. Look at verse 7. 1 Samuel chapter 8, verse 7. And the Lord said to Samuel, Obey the voice of the people in all that they say to you. For they have not rejected you, but they've rejected me from being king over them. According to all the deeds that they have done from the day I brought them up out of Egypt, even to this day, forsaking me and serving other gods, so they are also doing to you. Now then, obey their voice, only you shall solemnly warn them and show them the ways of the king who shall reign over them. Right? Israel was rejecting God by asking for a king. They want a king to fight for them instead of God fighting for them. The only reason they've ever conquered anything is because God has fought for them. That is a lesson they should have seen over and over again. But instead they're going, we need a a king to fight over us. Fight fight for us. To reign over us. And they don't want God to do that. They want an earthly king. And so what God is showing them and allowing them to have what they want is that this is not for your good. It's better to trust me, God says, and my plan rather than that. So Samuel gives them a warning, but despite the warning, the people insisted. Look at verse 19. 
But the people refused to obey the voice of Samuel. And they said, no, but there shall be a king over us that we also may be like all the nations. And there's the problem, right? They want to be just like all the other nations. This is the, this is the proverbial kid going, but everyone's doing it. Argument. And it works just as well here. It makes just as much sense here as it does when kids say that to their parents. No, but there should be a king over us that we may be also like all the nations, that our king may judge us and go out before us and fight our battles. So they want a, a king who will be judge and who will be warrior. Well, they already had a king who was their judge and warrior, but they don't want God. Verse 21, And when Samuel had heard all the words of the people, he repeated them in the ears of the Lord, and the Lord said to the Samuel, Obey their voice and make them a king. Verse 20, I think, explains why this is a rejection of God. They don't just want a king, they want a king like all the other nations. right? So they, Think about what, that, what they're actually asking. They're basically saying, we want, a, we want a different ruler than God, we want, our, we want new laws, we want a new religion, we want new authority, we want something other than what God has given us and what all God has given us. We don't want any of these things. We don't want the law, we don't want this religion, we don't want God. We want a king, an earthly king. Now, is the desire for a king wrong? Well, no, in one sense, right? Because it's been promised that they're going to have a king. But what they're asking for is not for God to make his promises known. They're asking for God to change what all he's doing. For they're rejecting God. So this call is not, uh, when they say, give us a king, they're not saying, fulfill the Abrahamic promises. They're rejecting God outright as king. And so Israel's first choice of king, what, what were they looking for? Yeah, rich, good looking. What? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so what what was Saul those things? Yeah. He was. He's a head taller than everybody else. Good looking. But what was the one characteristic that he was missing? Yeah, hard after God. He was not a member of the tribe of Judah, which is also a problem, right? He was not a man after God's own heart. He was a failure. And because it was set up by their sinful longings, the whole thing was a disaster. Saul was semi-successful at times, right? He gave a measure of prosperity and protection to the kingdom. But what did he do that showed that he was about, all about himself? He put up monuments to himself, right? Made rash vows related to his pride. He disobeyed commands of sacrifice and warfare. And once we saw the, the rise to David, we see his, the, the promise of David, we see the, his sinfulness really on display. Kind of all, the, all the, the, the cloaking of his sin was kind of pulled back after, the, after it was made clear that David was going to be king, Right? And so, what happened to, Saul's, to Saul and his lineage? They all got wiped out. Yeah, you're getting the, the, that sign? That's exactly right. They all got wiped out. And so, uh, this brings Israel's kingdom history all the way from Abraham's promises through the law of Moses, uh, to, through the conquest of Canaan by Israel, to the judges' deliverance of the people, to the people's preference for an earthly king, and Saul's failures as that earthly king. And then, now we get to the actual promise of... Now, to stop for a second, the Mosaic Covenant actually, I think, actually anticipates the Davidic Covenant in some ways. Not only by laying out basic laws for a king, but also in recognizing that... that, um, that Deuteronomy, I think especially Deuteronomy 12, looks forward to a time when there would be a centralized location for worship in the kingdom. And I think this is a part of the covenant that, that we may maybe forget a little bit. The part of the kingdom is not just the existence of a kingdom, but that the kingdom is also tied to a temple. And that's promised in Deuteronomy 12. You can look back to this. So Deuteronomy 12. I, I'm sorry, I, I said I was going to make you just go left to right, and I was wrong. Deuteronomy 12, 
We'll come back to Samuel in just a minute. Deuteronomy 12, verse 8. You shall not do according to all that we are doing here today, everyone doing whatever is right in his own eyes. So here's that language in Deuteronomy that we see at the end of Judges, right? See why the connection is made here. For you have not as yet come to the rest and the inheritance that the Lord your God is giving you. Where does that come? In the land. Verse 10. But when you go over the Jordan and live in the land that the Lord your God is giving you to inherit, and when he gives you rest from all your enemies around so that you live in safety, then to the place that the Lord your God will choose to make his name dwell there, this is the key, there you shall bring all that I command you, your burnt offerings, your sacrifices, your tithes, and the contribution that you present, and all your finest vow offerings that you vow to the Lord, and you shall rejoice before the Lord your God, you and your sons and your daughters, your male servants, your female servants, and the Levite that is within your towns, since he has no portion or inheritance with you. So the Mosaic Covenant in Deuteronomy 12 puts before the people a prospect that there's going to be some sort of consummation of these promises, that they are going to enter the land, experience rest from their enemies, and that kind of idyllic picture of the Abrahamic promise. That they're going to be in the place, there's going to be no more enemies around, all the enemies will be defeated, they're going to be at rest, they're going to have their own houses, their own, they're not going to be wandering around. They're going to have their own houses, their own vineyards, their own crops. They're going to be staying put, and there will be a place there where God is going to dwell. The place that the Lord your God will choose to make His name dwell there. And this place will be a place of sacrifice and offerings. So the people of God, in the land of God, with the presence and blessing of God, this is what Israel is called to be looking toward through all its covenants. And I think that sets the stage for the covenant itself. That's a, that's, that's a little aside that we're going to come back to. Now go back with me to 2 Samuel. All that set up. 20 minutes of setup to get to the Davidic covenant right here. So the Bible records the covenant that God makes with David in 2 Samuel chapter 7. All right, 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 8. Now therefore, thus you shall say to my servant David, Thus says the Lord of hosts, I took you from the pasture, from following the sheep, that you should be prince over my people Israel. And I have been with you wherever you went, and have cut off all your enemies from before you. And I will make, you, make for you a great name, like the name of the great ones of the earth. And I will appoint a place for my people Israel, and will plant them, so they may dwell in their own place and be disturbed no more, and violent men shall afflict them no more as formerly. From the time that I appointed judges over my people Israel, and I will give you rest from all your enemies. All right? Here's the, that's the promise that was the fulfillment of what we saw in Deuteronomy and Genesis. Moreover, the Lord declares to you that the Lord will make you a house. When your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring after you. By the way, this is a, a key promise here that happens later on, right? When, when they're like, I'm going to make a house for you, Lord, and... You remember the actual promise is that the Lord's like, no, I said I would make you a house. I'm going to make you a people. And there's a play on words there and how the word house is used. When your days are filled, you lie down with your fathers, I'll raise up your offspring after you, who shall come from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. 13. He shall build a house for my name. All right, I'm going to make you a house, and your offspring is going to build a house for my name. And I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son when he commits iniquity, I will discipline him with the rod of men, with the stripes of the sons of men. But my steadfast love will not depart from him, as I took it from Saul, whom I put away from before you. And your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever. All right. You can see that the blessings are really, there's kind of three key blessings in this promise, in this, in this promise that God is making to David. In verse 16, it says that David's house, his kingdom and throne... We're going to be established and made sure. All right? The kingship of Israel is not founded on the people's desire to free themselves from God, like they did with Saul, right? But on God's commitment to establish the throne of David. This is what the kingship is based on. The kingship isn't based on the commitment of the people. 
the kingship is based on the commitment of God. Right? So who is going to ensure that David's throne will be established forever? This is God. God says he will do this. Right? That becomes the basis for the entire nation. That's the stability of the nation is not on the strength of the people. It's on the promise of God. They can look to the king and see God's appointed king, and they can go, oh, because we have a king, we know his kingdom is going to be established forever. Right? Secondly, we see tied up in this that there's going to be prosperity and rest in Canaan. Right? Verse 10 and 11 say that. This had been promised, by the way, through Moses, and it was partially fulfilled in the time of Joshua, right? Um, Joshua 21 says that the, the Lord gave them rest on every side, just as he had sworn to their fathers. And they did, for a time. This promise is greater than that. The rest was problematic, it's partial, it's incomplete. Now the promise of God in the Davidic covenant is that it's going to be fulfilled for the entire nation, not just for this tribe over here or this tribe over here, not just for a little bit of time, but for eternity there will be rest from enemies. There will be security and safety for the, tr- for the people. And so uh, when Solomon dedicated the temple, he declared this promise was fulfilled in 1 Kings 8. This is what he says. For, Blessed be the Lord who has given rest to his people, Israel, according to all that he promised. Not one word has failed of all his good promise, which he spoke by Moses, his servant. And so he's even tying it back through the Davidic covenant back to Moses. All right. God's going to bless not just uh, Israel when it's at rest and its borders, but God's going to bless them when they go into war, right? And so his, his protection of his king and his people will be total. I think the third thing is we see that, this is kind of tied into that, the presence and protection of God. The Davidic covenant is full of language of God's presence. Look at verse 9, you see that. God says that he's been with David. Verse 13, God says the one of David's descendants will build a house for God, a house of God's presence. Verse 15, God promises that his steadfast love will not depart from David's descendants. God will be with David's line. He's going to protect it. And this is where I, why I stopped to give that kind of aside about the temple. Because at the heart of the Davidic covenant is the temple. Right? David is contemplating trying to build a temple for God since the presence of God among the people is still mediated through the tabernacle. But God told David he would not be the one to build the temple. Why won't he build the temple? Why won't David be the one to build the temple? Besides the fact that he just said it was going to be your offspring and not you. He's a warrior. Yeah. Why is that a problem? Was there, was there something wrong with David doing that? Now, I've heard this over and over again, but I've never heard, not, not, not for me. I mean, I've, I've, yes, you're giving the right answer. You're giving the right answer. It's because he's a man of war. Growing up, I heard that all the time. Oh, David couldn't build the house because there's blood on his hands. Is that the problem? Didn't, didn't God command him to do the things that he was doing? Is God punishing David by saying, you can't build this house? No. It's the fulfillment of, it's the consummation of that promise that was made back there. This, the temple was to be a symbol of the rest and prosperity of a nation that's been delivered. And so David's rule is one of, of a warrior king. His offspring would be the one who's at peace. And so the temple is to be a place of peace. It's to symbolize that peace and the consummation of all the promises. God, is, is, it's not a punishment to David that you can't build the house because there's blood on your hands. Uh, that's what I've al- I always heard growing up. He can't do it because there's blood on his hands. and God doesn't honor that. No, God commanded him to have blood on his hands. He did exactly what he was supposed to do. It wasn't a punishment to David. This was a blessing for Solomon, whose name, by the way, means what? Peace. And Solomon is this king of peace. The man of peace is going to build the temple. In 1 Kings 6, God says to Solomon, concerning this house that you're building, if you walk in my statutes and obey my rules and keep all my commandments and walk in them, then I will establish my word with you, which I spoke to David, your father, and I will dwell among the children of Israel and will not forsake my people Israel. God promised to dwell among the children of Israel through the temple, and all that is part of the Davidic covenant. Right? So think about what we've just gone through, if we're thinking through the history of Israel here. The generation of Joshua and Caleb comes out of Egypt and into Canaan. They die. Their children, good, good children or bad children? 
idolatrous, right? They pass through the time of the judges, they die. At the tail end of the judges, you get Samuel. He dies in 1 Samuel 25. David's old and dies in 1 Kings 2. When one arrives at the period of the construction of the temple under Solomon, Israel is at last in their own land, filled with their own people, under their own king, with God in their temple, in their capital city. They're finally at rest for the first time, essentially ever. And under Solomon, all the promises and blessings of God that were given to Abraham, and then given to Moses, and then given to David, they reach their consummation. So, I think the argument can be made that the, when Solomon dedicates the temple, it's the high point of the entire Old Testament. This is the, the apex of what everything had been working toward in the Old Testament. Now, we know there's more to come in the promise of the New Covenant, but the, the apex of the Old Testament is the dedication of the temple that Sol, that, where Solomon makes the, the dedication of the temple. Right? Anyone want to ca- contradict that or counter that? Is that, a, is that a crazy thought? Because it's the one time that all these promises have come true and the people are at rest in the land with a king, no enemies attacking them, not at war. And so I, it's, an interesting, it's, a, it's an interesting reality to go, that, that's, and that's where it, it, it was, that was the apex, and then... It all fell apart after that. Because <laughs> it's like it, that, the apex didn't last long. So, now is that all the Davidic covenant? Is it just those promises? Because what have we, what have we said is necessary for covenants to be covenants? There has to be some sort of stipulation. Are there any commands that are given to David? And there are. There are three commands that are given to David. God gave this command to David and his offspring, and their sanctions associated with with other David and his sons were faithful to to obey these commands and conditions. I'm going to write these things down as we go through them. Here are these three. In 2 Samuel 7, verse 13, God says of David's son that he shall build a house for my name. Right? A house for God's name is not just the house named after God. God names it, his, it after his presence. It's the king's responsibility to construct a temple where God's presence will be manifested among his people and where the people will worship their God. Right? So in 1 Kings 8, the temple is completed by Solomon. The Israelites celebrate. They have this huge dedication service. Solomon offers up prayers to God. This is the prayer that he offers up. Are you, are you in 1 Kings 8 still? 1 Kings 8. Verse 27. But will God indeed dwell on the earth? Behold, heaven and the highest heaven cannot contain you. How much less this house I've built, right? It seems like Solomon has the right understanding of what the temple is, right? It's not a box that contains God. It's the place that God chooses to rest his glory among his people, right? He has a right understanding of what the temple is. Verse 28, yet have regard to the prayer of your servant and to his plea, O Lord my God, listening to the cry and to the prayer that your servant prays before you this day, that your eyes may be open night and day toward this house, a place of which you have said, my name shall be there, that you may listen to the prayer that your servant offers toward this place. All right, Solomon knew that the temple doesn't contain God, but it does, and here's the, I think the right phrase for this, mediate his presence to the people. It's the place that they go to meet the presence of God, Right? And so central to the entirety of the kingship and the Davidic covenant, central to the old covenant as a whole, is the temple and God's presence. What's the job of the king then in related, related to the temple? Well, the, the king needs to guard the temple. He needs to guard the temple. What does that mean? What does it mean to guard the temple? Okay. But I mean, what's, the, what's the primary thing that happens at the temple? 
sacrifices, worship. What's the king's job? To protect worship. The purity of the temple worship is his concern and responsibility. Um, by the way, isn't this what happens from Solomon onward throughout the rest of the Old Testament? This is really what determines whether or not a king is a good king or, not, or a bad king. Is Does he keep the temple sacrifices pure, and does he allow other altars to be built elsewhere in the kingdom? Right? That's, that's what it, the whole thing rises and falls with. Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah uh, it's part of where the confusion is. Okay. I mean, yes. That opens a whole, a whole other can of worms. But, we'll, but yes. No, no, you're fine. <laughs> all right? I mean, the question that always happens throughout the rest of the Old Testament, from Solomon onward, through all the kings, is did they purify the land from idolatry? Did they keep the land pure from idolatry? And do they lead the people to holy worship? That's really the question. Isn't that, think about how all the kings are described. He did not tear down all the high places. Right? I mean, every time this, the new king came on the scene and he tore down all the high places and restored worship. This king came on the scene and he did not tear down all the high places. Right? That's, that's how the whole thing works. So the responsibility of, of the king is to guard the temple. To guard the temple and wor- we'll just say worship here. Worship of God. That's the, the responsibility of the king. The, the king, in this sense, has kind of a priestly sort of function. The king is supposed to, he's not a priest, but the purity of God's worship and temple are part of his concern. But secondly, what else is he supposed to do? He's supposed to keep God's law. Um, what, what was the king supposed to do upon becoming king? Write out a copy of the law. Isn't that interesting? God gave laws to Israel's future kings. Do, do you remember where that law was given? After David was made king? No. Deuteronomy 17. Like the promise is made back here. This is what the king's supposed to do. Write out a copy of the law. This, this gives the, the king a certain level of prophetic responsibility in the kingdom. So we see that the king has some priestly responsibility. The king has some responsibility. He's supposed to keep God's law. Right? The king, this is different though than all the earthly kings. What do earthly kings do? What? They make their own law. I'm the law. I'm the king. I do what I want to do. The king doesn't create the law, the king keeps the law. Right? He is an under king. He's a vice regent to Israel. God says in the Davidic covenant, when he commits iniquity, I will discipline him with the rod of men. The opposite then is true that when the king keeps the law and practices righteousness, righteousness, he will not be disciplined, he'll be blessed. So he has to guard the temple, he has to keep the law. A third thing that we see as we kind of piece all the things together is that he has to represent God's people. Um, And this is where we get to the idea of headship again. Or if we want to get super technical, what we call federal headship. Right? The king is the representative. Can you guys see that from right there? The king is the representative for the people. Federal headship, by the way, is, 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 the, in, is central to making covenants in the Bible. All these covenants are made with representatives. Adam stepping in the place of all his offspring. This covenant made with Abraham and his offspring and Moses and, his, and their offspring. Now, these are all tied together because the offspring are here. But David and his offspring are within the Abrahamic line. Right? They're not a separate people. They're inside the Abrahamic line. Right, covenant of grace, new covenant made with Christ, all with federal headship. Right, God covenants with one person on the behalf of many. Right, in the Davidic covenant, David is the federal head of his sons. Only David's sons, his physical offspring, have the rightful claim to this covenant because they fall under his federal headship. But 
David's federal headship over his sons is not really what we're talking about here. Rather, the Davidic king is appointed as the federal head of the Mosaic Covenant. Does that make sense? This king rules up over this to receive the blessings of this. The Mosaic Covenant had a mediator, Moses, but not a federal head in, that, in the truest sense. God delivered the law through Moses, but descent through Moses was basically back on this. And that's why the Davidic king oversees this people through this law. Does that make sense? Is that too complicated? Again, that's why these things are all tied together. So the Davidic covenant established the heirs of David as the representatives or the federal heads of the kingdom. They're not just to lead the people in an example of righteousness and law-keeping. They're to represent the people in their law-keeping. That means if the king is righteous, so the nation is blessed. The king is evil, then the people are cursed. What happens throughout the history of Israel? Are the people blessed or cursed? Yes. Yes. What more than the other? Cursed. A whole lot more. All right? I, I just remind you, the, the quick way to remember this is, all right, the kingdom is divided. Um, Judah. Good kings or bad kings? Yes. Mixture. Israel. Good kings or bad kings? All bad. Not a single good king in Israel after the, the breakup of the kingdom. Right? Righteous kings bring blessing on the land. Wicked kings bring curses on the land. And the rest of the Old Testament is the story of how righteous kings kind of keep the status quo and the, and the, uh, and the wicked kings tear, the, country, uh, tear the, the nation apart and lead them into disarray and expulsion from the land and slavery under other peoples. And so you can, ask, you can very quickly ascertain as to the state of the, the nation, the state of the people, by asking, where are they? If they're in Babylon, are they under the blessing? They're under the curses. Why? What drove them there? Bad king. Right? What are the sanctions? What are the sanctions of this covenant? So here's the responsibilities of the covenant. What are the sanctions? All right, do this and live. Don't do this and die. That's kind of the general thing. The Davidic king was a federal head, a representative for the nation. His obedience, disobedience determines everything, blessing or cursing. And I think we see that even come to light when we see what the, the sanctions are, what the, the consequences for disobedience are. All right? In the Davidic covenant, God gave promises to David and his descendants. He obligated David and his descendants to obey certain laws. To make this a formal covenant, God, God threatens David's sons with discipline and punishment. So 2 Samuel 7, verse 14. I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. When he commits iniquity, I will discipline him with the rod of men with the stripes of the Son of Men. The Davidic king and God have a special father-son relationship. God will protect and bless the king, watching over him, but when the king does not keep the law, God will discipline him and punish him. Right? Uh, David repeats this in Psalm 132. Right? The Lord swore to David a sure oath from which he will not turn back. This is what Psalm 132 says. One of the sons of your body I will set on your throne. If, you, if your sons keep my covenant and my testimonies that I shall teach them, their sons also forever shall sit on your throne. If the sons keep the covenant, this is David's interpretation of God's promise to him. If the sons keep the covenant, then they will sit on the throne. They must do what is required of them or they'll be punished and disciplined. They have to do these things. And if they don't, they will be removed from the throne. They will be taken off of the throne under the judgment of God himself. Right? 1 Kings 8. Solomon declares the same thing. Verse 25. Therefore... Lord God of Israel, now keep what you promised your servant David, my father, saying, You shall not fail to have a man sit before me on the throne of Israel. Only if your sons take heed to their way that they walk before me as you have walked before me. And now I pray, O God of Israel, let your word come true, which you have spoken to your servant David, my father. What's another consequence for disobedience? And the answer is expulsion. Judgment from God, removal from the throne, expulsion from the land which makes sense because these are the promises of 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 god back to the abrahamic people disobey this and you're going to be receiving the curses in the mosaic covenant and you're going to be receiving the curses of being removed from the land right so discipline and punishment aren't just a slap on the wrist but a complete disinheritance of the promises that were given to abraham right after the temple is completed, this is 1 Kings 9. Are you still in 1 Kings? Look at 1 Kings 9. Verse 
God appears to Solomon. 1 Kings 9, verse 4. And as for you, if you, walk, if you will walk before me as David your father walked with integrity of heart and uprightness, doing according to all that I have commanded you and keeping my statutes and my rules, then I will establish your royal throne over Israel forever. As I promised David, saying, you shall not lack a man on the throne of Israel. So, right, he, sets, he sets the conditional nature of the promises. If you will walk before me, doing according to all that I have commanded you, keeping my statutes and my rules, then I will establish your throne forever. Verse 6, but if you turn aside from following me, you or your children, and do not keep my commandments and statutes. That I've set before you. And this house will become a heap of ruins. Everyone passing by will be astonished and hiss, and they'll say, why has the Lord done this to the land and to this house? And they will, then they will say, because they abandoned the Lord their God who brought their fathers out of the land of Egypt and laid hold on other gods and worshipped them and served them, therefore the Lord has brought all this disaster on them. Right? So all these, I think this is kind of the summary of all these things we've talked about. If Solomon and his sons obey God's law, his statutes, his rules... They'll be blessed. If they turn aside and don't keep the commandments, then they're going to be cut off from the land. And God even quotes that statement there about um, uh, Israel will become a proverb and a byword among the people. That's a, a reference to Deuteronomy 28, where Israel's threatened that it will become like a byword and proverb, and, you know, where people will walk by and look at the people of Israel and go, at least we're not like Israel. That's how bad the judgment of God will be on them. So... Uh, the Davidic covenant is much like the Abrahamic covenant. God makes a promise that, we're, that we're, sh we're sure to the whole nation, but individuals and groups can be cut off. And that's kind of how the promise is to David, right? The promise is made to David's line, but there will be individuals cut off. In fact, there were many. God's promises to David are sure to his line, but individual kings who are unfaithful are cut off from those blessings. God took the throne from Solomon because he didn't keep the covenant, but he didn't take it away entirely because of the sake of David, right? The cycle repeats through the many generations until we get to 2 Kings 23. You can turn there, 2 Kings 23. Here we are in Judah. Israel has been destroyed and exiled for over 100 years at this point. But there came a time when Judah would no longer be allowed to stay in this land because of its wickedness and idolatry, right? So Israel, those kings led them into exile many years before. Judah, it's, it was dicey. And here we are, 2 Kings 23, verse 26. Still the Lord did not turn from the burning of his great wrath by which his anger was kindled against Judah because of all the provocations with which Manasseh had provoked him. And the Lord said, I will remove jo Judah also out of my sight as I have removed Israel. And I will cast off this city that I have chosen, Jerusalem, and the house which I said, my name shall be there. Right, so prior to this point, Judah had been called to repent, return to God. But from Manasseh onward, Judah's downfall was inevitable and it came about because of the wickedness of a king the line of kings wicked kings kept being propagated and cursed and it culminates in complete expulsion and exile from judah as goes the king so goes the kingdom that's the lesson of representing the people and so the curse exacted on Israel is declared by God in the same terms as pro proposed in the Davidic covenant. The worst thing that can happen to Israel is for God to remove his presence from the temple. And that's exactly what we see happen. How do we know God's judgment was final at that point? Because his, his presence leaves. He will no longer wrestle with an obstinate people. And he takes his presence from the temple. So... So far as the Davidic king keeps the Mosaic covenant, the kingdom enjoys the blessings of the Abrahamic covenant. And so far as the Davidic king fails to keep the Mosaic covenant, the kingdom suffers the curses of the covenant. And that's why these three things are tied together. By the way, just as a side note, uh, um, those three words, where do we see those? Same responsibility is given to Adam in the garden. Guard, keep, represent the people. 
side note on that. Not a whole lot to say on that, just an observation. So, how do we conclude this? So, you put all these things together, all these covenants together, these three covenants, Abraham, Mosaic, Davidic, you see the kingdom of Israel in its fullness. Um, the kingdom of Israel is what it is. Its, its, its boundaries are marked off. Its people are marked off. Its worship is marked off by these three covenants. This is what defines it. these three things right here. Who are its people? Who are its leaders? How is it structured? What are its laws? What are the promises? How do we know there's a land? All those sorts of things. The, the origin of the temple. All those things are wrapped up in these three covenants. This is the old covenant. Same parties, same precepts, same laws, same promises, same curses and blessings, same penalties. All these things are tied to the same people for these three covenants. All right? Abraham's federal headship over the people continues to define the people in that kingdom. Abraham's inheritance of Canaan continues to determine the boundaries of the kingdom. The Mosaic covenant just expands the obligations of the people in the land. And the Davidic covenant focuses the kingdom into one person through whom obedience or disobedience is going to determine the fate of the, of the people. Right? But I don't believe the Mosaic and Davidic covenants do extend any further than the initial scope that's set down by the Abrahamic covenant. Right? It's about life in the land of Canaan. God's covenant must be kept. This is why the Old Covenant includes all three of those. Right? Moses, the Mosaic Covenant, sort of controls the Abrahamic and Davidic covenants. The Mosaic Covenant is the most prominent one throughout the Old Testament, right? Because it controls whether or not you're going to receive the blessings of this. Are the people, the physical offspring of Abraham, going to receive the blessings? How do we know? Because they keep this. Who leads them to keep this? This. And so I think that's the, how we summarize the entirety of the Old Covenant. And the Davidic covenant kind of is the, the kind of final straw, the final layer of this to help us understand it. I was planning to finish at 1030. That was pretty impressive. <laughs> it's 1030. It gives us a couple minutes if there's any questions. Or more time to drink tea if there's not any questions. Mm. Yeah, it, I think it was it, to make it obvious that it wasn't it wasn't the king, right? If he would have chosen, if he would have chosen someone from the tribe of Judah, and then you go, oh well, this is exactly what the promises were. Is the it was the obvious like let's give them what they want, but let's make it very clear that this is not the promised one, because the promise had been made clear to Judah, and so if the people were if the people were aware of the promises. If there was anyone left in Israel who was aware of the promises, then they would know, well, this can't be right. Does that make sense? I, th I think it was, it's just a judgment on them that, all right, let's give them what they're asking for, but let's make sure that it's not even mistaken for what, what is promised. Right. Yeah, give them what they want. It's similar to how uh, you see uh, God, how, um, how God communicates to us through Paul and Romans, where it says that God hands them over to their desires, it, it's that same kind of thing. It's a judgment. You're not receiving the actual promises of the, of the line. The, the promise was made through the line of Judah, and that's not Saul. And so it should have been obvious very quickly that he's a fake king. And so there is a, again, I refrain from making Lord of the Rings references but there, there is a king who is, who is unknown to the people hiding in their midst. And so it's, and he is the one who is gonna, who's the, for the right lineage. And so when David comes on the scene, I think there's hints of, I mean, some of you have read through this story a lot. I mean, but I think there's hints that Saul knows all along. This is <laughs> like, I'm on borrowed time. And then as soon as, because the immediate reaction of David to the, the announcement of David, that, that's, now it's just protection of his own position. And so, which again shows, shows you where his heart is because he wasn't looking for the fulfillment of the promises of God for the people. If so, he would have embraced David as king. 
but instead he wants to kill David as king. And so Saul puts himself in the line of, uh, Saul becomes the father of King Herod later on, right? I mean, that's, that's his sp- spiritual offspring is the one, the, the fake king who sits on the throne who wants to murder the true offspring. That's, that's Saul is King Herod. King Herod is Saul. And so, yeah, I think it's the, yeah, I think that's why it's important. Yeah. It's a great question. I don't know. That's uh, because it's kind of asking to get into his mind. Hard to say. I mean, I, I like I said before. I think Saul. I think you get glimpses of the fact that Saul realizes like he's not. He doesn't. He's not resting on God. I mean, he's not trusting in God. I mean, even the times where he kind of appeals to God, it's this sort of like fake thing. Like, oh yeah, I did that. Oh yeah, we destroyed that. Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, it's like it's when you lie to God. I don't think he's really resting in like I'm trusting in God's power to do the, these things. So there's kind of a, a there's kind of he kind of despises God. I think God is a hindrance to his plan for his own kingdom, which means it's the perfect he's the perfect king for disobedient Israel because he rejects God just like the people got, reject God. Yeah, yeah. When something is taken from him, then he turns to God, but then he only does partially what God tells him to do, which is the perfect picture of disobedient Israel. Disobedient Israel over and over again, it wasn't that they refused to worship God all, all the time. It's that they alongside all these other things, right? They didn't go down and burn down their own temple. They just had all these other places, right? And so it, he's the perfect picture of disobedient Israel. Yeah. Saul is a, a tragic tale in that sense, right? Any other questions? Okay. Generally speaking, is, is this being helpful to help think through? Hopefully, we're now, I know we've kind of dug in deep on some of the minutia of things over here, but I'm hoping that that's going to do, um, that that difficult spade work that we did in the beginning is going to produce some good for us as we move forward. I mean, we have to do all that hard work of kind of digging down deep and making sure the soil is ripe for our brains to understand all that comes after it. And so hopefully in the coming weeks, um, what I want to do next week is to look at how all of this points to Christ. And then we will move forward and see how the covenant of redemption and the covenant of grace are themselves out. So All right, let me pray for us. Uh, Father God, thank you for this time together, Lord. I pray that you will be glorified by what we've said and done here. May may you bury your truth deep in our hearts. May you use this to um, not just exercise our brains or puff us up with knowledge, but that that we may love you and worship you and you alone. I pray all these things in the name of our King, our Mediator, our Prophet, Priest, and King, the Chosen One, Jesus. We pray it in his name. Amen.